So our first speaker is uh, Dan. Uh, Dan heads up the chromatin dynamics team at the Institute for Integrative um, Biology of the Cell at the University. Um, since joining the Institute in 2014, he and his team have been studying how structural aspects of 3D genome organization are involved in transcriptional regulation in mammalian cells. Today, his talk will be the enrichment of long and low abundant DNA fragments for nanopore sequencing and its applications. There'll be time at the end for um, some questions and this will be at the end of every talk. So please put them in the question section at the top right of your screen. Over to you, Dan. Thank you very much for, uh, for, the, uh, for the introduction, Alexandra. And uh, I would like to thank uh, everyone uh, for joining us at this uh, webinar, uh, which I'm uh, so co-organizing with, with Alexandra, co-hosting with Alexandra. So this is the fourth uh, of the microgenomics, uh, microgenomics webinars. And as Alexandra uh, said, I will be talking today about uh, our newly developed technology to enrich uh, long and low abundant DNA fragments. And uh, in the time that I have available, I'll also talk a little bit how we have been uh, applying this, uh, this, this technology for, uh, for a number of scientific questions. So uh, what I will tell you about today is I will first uh, discuss very briefly uh, just uh, the, the, the development of high throughput sequencing and then uh, particularly about uh, the developments in the, the field of third generation single molecule sequencing. And um, then uh, following up on that, I will, I will introduce why it's important uh, when using uh, third generation sequencing to have ways of, for enrichment and also amplification of long DNA molecules. And I will then introduce our uh, newly developed approach, which is called ELF-CLAMP, which stands for Enrichment of Long DNA Fragments Using Capture and Linear Amplification. And then uh, briefly in the time that I have uh, remaining, I will talk about two of our amplification applications. Uh, first, to the characterization of uh, structural variation of, uh, of the genome. Uh, and finally, uh, much more related to the work we normally work in in my lab, uh, studying the, the dynamics of 3D genome organization, uh, which uh, with uh, uh, third generation sequencing, we can now do with, uh, with single cell precision. So very briefly, uh, I think uh, uh, most of us will be very well aware how uh, high throughput sequencing has, uh, has evolved in the last 20 years and particularly has revolutionized uh, uh, biological studies. Um, and this, uh, uh, this, this is particularly due, uh, has it in the last 20 years been particularly due uh, mostly by, by uh, the developments by Illumina, uh, which is sort of se uh, considered second generation sequencing using a methodology that's called sequencing by synthesis. And uh, just to show you, uh, uh, so in the little uh, figure here on the right, unfortunately uh, for the, the participants, I do not have a, a pointer. So we'll be uh, visualizing things on the screen by, by pointing them out to you uh, using words. Um, but so uh, in the, uh, since, since the original uh, uh, development of, of uh, second generation sequencing, we see now that uh, uh, the highest resolution Illumina Nova Seq runs can generate up to 60 billion read pairs in, in one single runs, which means that we're talking about uh, tera basis of data per, uh, per experiment. Uh, and at the same time, uh, the, the, the costs of uh, sequencing in the last 20 years have, uh, have uh, tremendously dropped as well. We're now uh, for the for the, the most cost uh, efficient sequencing experiments. We're talking about about ten euros of gigabase per gigabase of sequence, which is a, 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 a nearly a million fold reduction in price in in the last twenty years. So this has really opened up uh, uh, genome sequencing as a as a, a technology available and accessible for almost everyone. Now, um, I think uh, the applications of high throughput sequencing are also, uh, uh, most of you are very well uh, aware, uh, not only uh, can high throughput sequencing be used for, for more traditional genome sequencing, uh, so genome assembly, uh, but also detection of structural variation and, and applications uh, for metagenomics, so to characterize complex uh, uh, complex uh, populations of, of organism, uh, but it has also opened up a whole range of applications for functional genomics, where I think uh, the most widely used application is uh, is transcriptomics, uh, but there's also all kinds of assays for uh, different aspects of genome structure and functions, like with protein binding, for instance, chip seek or cut and tag and cut and run, uh, epigenetics, uh, particularly uh, focusing on DNA methylation, but all kinds of other uh, assays for DNA structure. And increasingly, we see that assays are developed uh, 
where multiple uh, uh, aspects of genome organization and function are, uh, are probed at the same time. And finally, a very exciting uh, development is all uh, the, the, the recent uh, uh, developments going towards single cell and spatial genomics uh, applications. And here I'm uh, uh, particularly excited that uh, Joachim Lunderberg has also joined us today who will talk about the development of uh, spatial genomics and spatial transcriptomics in, uh, later on during this, uh, this webinar. Now, when we talk about a second generation, as I already mentioned, we mostly uh, uh, primarily talk about Illumina sequencing. Uh, and so I want to focus a little bit on, uh, on the advantages of this technology, but also on a number of technical limitations. So I think uh, Illumina sequencing, particularly in the last few years, uh, it has really gone extremely far in the throughput uh, per run. And at the same time, that has also meant that the cost uh, per base pair of sequencing is, uh, uh, is very, very affordable nowadays. Moreover, uh, a very big advantage of Illumina sequencing is that library preparation can be done on very tiny amount of sequences, of tiny amounts of biological samples, which is really a big advantage of, uh, of, of, of uh, second generation Illumina sequencing. And uh, I think due to its long and very wide long uh, use and its very wide application, it has really become the gold standard for, for, for sequencing approaches, which includes uh, uh, a lot of uh, validations for use in, in the clinic as well. And finally, uh, uh, due to the, the, the widespread application of this uh, technology, we've also seen that it has been adapted for a very wide range of assays that I introduced in my, uh, in my uh, previous presentation. But that said, there are definitely a number of limitations to Illumina sequencing and all other second generation sequencing as well. And I think a major limitation is that the reads that are generated, so there are really many reads generated, but each individual read is relatively short. Uh, I put here less than 1 KB, but we're more talking in, uh, in most applications in the order of uh, 100 to maybe 300 base pairs per, uh, per contiguous read. And uh, even though there are possibilities to artificially uh, 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 make those reads longer, they are very, uh, very complicated and, and also not very cost efficient. So I really consider this a major li limitation of Illumina sequencing. And the second limitation is the requirement for amplification. Uh, so this means not only that amplification is necessary to create libraries, but also the way that actually the samples are loaded onto the flow cell means that uh, there's a considerable amount of amplification required to, uh, to, to before the, the sequencing can start. Uh, and as a result, it means that uh, there's always the possibility that PCR biases are introduced in all uh, Illumina uh, analyses. And moreover, it means that we are not actually sequencing the DNA that we put into our, uh, into our sample, but we're actually uh, sequencing the DNA that has been generated uh, after amplification. And finally, uh, this is maybe a bit more of a specialist uh, limitation, but uh, sequencing of... Uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, Illumina uh, reads and all second generation reads is limited to, to DNA. And for instance, for transcriptomics, this means that we need to go through a, uh, a reverse transcription step uh, to, make, uh, to make cDNA. Now to uh, overcome some of these limitations, I think in the last 10 years, we've now seen the, the, the development and commercialization of third generation uh, sequencing. And so what makes third generation sequencing different from second generation and also first generation sequencing is that this is true single molecule sequencing. So in this case, uh, we're really looking at a single molecule uh, that goes into our reaction that is actually being sequenced. And I think on the, on the third generation market, we particularly have two big players, which are uh, Oxford Nanopore Technologies and, uh, and PegBio. And so the result of the single molecule uh, uh, sequencing allows us uh, to particularly to get uh, reads that are much, uh, much longer. So again, uh, so to, to, to give you some advantages and some technical limitations of these approaches. So uh, the major advantage of uh, third generation sequencing is that you can get uh, long, much longer reads. And essentially, and this is particularly true for the nanopore sequencing, is that uh, the, the, the read length you get uh, out of your experiment is actually determined by the read, uh, by the, the, the length of your sample that you put in. Uh, and so in the case of nanopore sequencing, when people have been using extremely uh, gentle ways of isolating DNA, uh, they have been able to, to generate reads that were more than one megabase in contiguous length, uh, really showing the power of these single molecule sequencing approaches. 
That said, uh, isolating such such very long DNA is not uh, not easy because most uh, normal is isolation DNA isolation protocols actually result in considerable sharing of DNA. So in most cases, DNA will be will be shorter in these kind of applications. Another um, uh, important advantage is that uh, in third molecules, uh, third generation sequencing, we're actually looking at single molecules. Uh, uh, sequencing of the native DNA that went into the reaction. And this uh, for both PEG-Bio and nanopore sequencing means that uh, they can also directly read out uh, base modifications, like for instance, uh, DNA methylations on the, on the C, uh, cytosine or adenosine basis of, uh, of, the, of the DNA. And uh, one particular advantage uh, of nanopore sequencing is that it's not only limited to DNA sequencing, but it can also directly uh, sequence RNA. So in this case, we do not need to go through a reverse transcription step to get to uh, to, to 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 get our base uh, information back. That said, uh, third uh, third generation sequencing it's very powerful, but it also comes with its uh, its limitations. I think uh, uh, the most uh, important. Uh, technical limitation for both approaches is that it has a more limited throughput. So in this case, we're more talking about uh, in the order of a one or a few million reads per, per experiment. Uh, and so even when those reads are, are uh, longer, this still means that we get considerably less data per experiment out as compared to the very high uh, throughput uh, approaches from, uh, from Illumina. And as a result, also the cost per base pair of the third generation sequencing is considerably higher still. Uh, and one last thing is that, uh, um, is that the, still these approaches, they require relatively large start amounts of material to make, to make libraries. Now, very briefly today, uh, for the application that I will show today, we'll mostly focus on nanopore sequencing. And when I talk about nanopore sequencing, I, I talk about uh, the, the, let's say, the, the, the smaller range of sequencers. Particularly, we like to use uh, the sequencer here that you can show, see in the middle of our slide, which is a, a min-ion sequencer. They're very, very small. They're the size of a few uh, matchboxes. And they can be directly plugged into a, to a computer with a USB cable. And within such a nanopore uh, min-ion device, what we see is that there's a, a, a few thousand nanopores present. And so each nanopore uh, has the capacity to, uh, to read a single stranded uh, DNA or RNA molecule. Uh, and it can do this over multiple cycles. And using a motor protein that either distinguishes between DNA or RNA, uh, a single strand of DNA is then pulled through the, the nanopore. And thereby, it creates uh, variations in the current that are on the, on the nanopore. And these variations in current, they change from base to base. And so this allows the nanopore to read and distinguish the different uh, uh, base pairs that pass through it, thereby uh, providing the sequencing information in the, in the nanopore experiment. So um, as I already mentioned, both PEG bio and nanopore experiments, the throughput is still a little bit limited. We're uh, typically talking about uh, a bit less than 10 gigabases of, uh, of, of sequencing data that are generated. And uh, as I already mentioned, there is one exception, and that is the uh, Oxford nanopore Promethean uh, system. But this I will, uh, for, the, for the sake of simplicity, leave out of, the, uh, of my discussion today, mostly because individual experiments on this platform uh, they are extremely expensive, so I think they're more out of range for most uh, for most users. But when we think about 10 gigabases of, uh, of, of sequencing output, we're a bit in a similar range as the size of the human genome. So when we're doing uh, when we're doing experiments on the human genome without any genome targeting, uh, what we will find is that our uh, genome is only covered uh, a few times, so in the order of maybe one to five uh, reads covering a random position in the human genome. So when we are interested in, uh, in, in, in high uh, density uh, data for specific loci in the genome, we need to, uh, uh, we need to enrich uh, for this. And this is actually a big challenge because enrichment of long DNA fragments is not as easy as you might, uh, you might imagine. And that is because uh, polymerase chain reaction, so well known as PCR, is actually suboptimal for the enrichment of, uh, of multi-KB fragments. Um, so because normally in second generation Illumina sequencing, a lot of PCR uh, experiments uh, steps are included. But PCR is very good to, uh, to amplify shorter fragments in the order of a few hundred base pairs. But when you have mixed populations of samples containing both smaller and larger fragments, uh, you will very uh, quickly see that there's a strong bias towards the shorter fragments. So PCR is not a very good way of, of, of uh, enriching 
for long DNA fragments, particularly when there need to be very long multi-KB fragments. And another limitation uh, is also that uh, PCR, uh, the way that this works, of course, we design two primers on both sides uh, of our fragment. Uh, so we do need to know the both sides of our fragments. And even though there's a way to overcome this by annealing uh, uh, more uh, global uh, adapters, it still uh, complicates generally our, uh, our life. So I think uh, um, a, a very interesting way of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of enriching for long day DNA fragments was published last year in a paper by, an, in a, by uh, the, the, the lab of Winston Tim in Nature Biotech. And this is the method that is called Nanopore CAS9 targeted sequencing or NCATS. And NCATS actually uh, uh, enriches for se uh, sequences of interest by depleting unwanted fragments. And so the way this works is that, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, a no after normal isolation of DNA, uh, our, our DNA will anyway be somewhat shared. So we have large fragments, but still in the range of several tens of KB. And in this case, uh, they, that material is then uh, dephosphorylated, which will later on mean that uh, library preparation is much less efficient. But then uh, CAS9, uh, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 uh, is used in vitro by designing guide RNAs of, uh, at sequences of interest. Uh, and where those uh, uh, guide RNAs bind to DNA and allow the cutting with CAS9, there we will see that the, the, the generated ends remain phosphorylated. So in the next step, uh, the adapter ligation will happen much, much more efficient uh, at those sites where, where the guide RNAs were located than elsewhere in the, in, the, in the genome. And as a result, you will see that there's indeed an enrichment of those fragments uh, for, the, for the sequencing. And this uh, approach has, I think, one very important advantage, and that is that this approach will still do sequencing of native DNA fragments. Uh, so one interesting thing is it can, can be included with, uh, for instance, determination of DNA methylation status as well. On the other hand, uh, maybe a limitation to the technique is that it uh, still ideally requires sequence knowledge uh, of both extremities because the, 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 the approach works better when a guide RNA is designed on both sides of the uh, of the of the of the fragment that we want to sequence, and I think importantly for people who want to are interested in using this, so this kit is now uh, commercialized by Oxford Nanopore Technologies already, uh, where it's sold as the Cas9 sequencing kit. Um, in parallel, we have also uh, in my lab we were also interested in uh, in, deter in in developing a way of uh, enriching for long DNA fragments, and I will later on explain why we were so enrichment uh, why we were interested in this. Uh, but we have developed our own technique, which we called uh, ELF clamp, which stands for enrichment of long DNA fragments by capsular and linear amplification. Uh, so this is different from NCATS, the previous technology that I showed you, because it does in fact uh, in, uh, involve an amplification step. So we use a, some, a somewhat similar uh, uh, first step. We also design a guide RNA, but in our case, one guide RNA is sufficient. So we only need knowledge uh, of the sequence on one side of a fragment. We use the guide RNA with in vitro CRISPR-Cas9 to, 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 to create a, a cut in, 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 uh, at a site, a predefined site in the genome. And then we use sequence homology to, uh, to, to, to anneal a T7, uh, a viral T7 promoter. And then with a short uh, pulse of, uh, of, um, of uh, 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 what is it? Um, DNA polymerase, we uh, extend uh, our fragments in such a way that the T7 promoter becomes stably uh, fused to our, pro of our, to our fragment of interest. And then we do in vitro transcription using a T7 uh, uh, RNA polymerase to generate uh, RNA. So we uh, our, our way of amplification and, and enrichment is actually by uh, changing, transforming our DNA into RNA. And then we take profit of the fact that the uh, Oxford Nanopore pl platform can not only sequence DNA, but also RNA. So the generated RNA we sequence, and then uh, using bioinformatics, we determine the, uh, uh, the sequence composition of these reads. And we found that, uh, that this amplification that we uh, reach is about a, a thousand fold. So this is, even though it's not as good as amplification uh, uh, achieved with PCR, it's, 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 I think it's a relatively good amplification that we uh, that we achieved through this linear amplification.
Now we wanted to benchmark our, uh, our, our, our technology, so our ELF clamp technology, and we did this uh, compared to the, the NCATS technology uh, uh, by using, uh, by characterizing, uh, in this case, what you see here is a, um, a small or a relatively a small uh, 6KB deletion that is uh, homozygously present in uh, the MCF7 uh, breast cancer cell line. And so this uh, uh, this deletion, it's a homozygous deletion, uh, and so both uh, in the in the the the, the, um, the study by uh, uh, that was published in Nature Biotech last year, they uh, designed guide RNAs around this uh, uh, this 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 deletion. Uh, so the guide position of the guide RNAs are indicated with the arrows. Uh, so in there in the study uh, with NCATS, they designed the guide RNAs on both sides, about six uh, kb away from this. Uh, uh, from the deletion, and in our case, we designed one single guide RNA, but we uh, designed it much closer to the to the deletion. And I think, uh, for comparison, what is important to realize is that uh, in both NCATS and ELF clamp, uh, we can we can uh, multiplex multiple viewpoints. So we're both in a similar setup, multiplexing about ten genomic regions in these uh, in these experiments. And so uh, one thing that you can see, so on top here, we have the, the MCF7 cancer, breast cancer cell line where the deletion is present. In the middle pattern here, you have the MCF10 uh, uh, control cell line, also using our ELF clamp uh, uh, assay. And so this one, uh, this cell line does not contain the deletion. And on the bottom, you then have the NCATS result uh, again in the MCF7 cell line. And so uh, when, uh, when interpreting this data, you should see that uh, the, the, the gray bars uh, provide you with a signal coverage. So this is, shows you how much signal is present uh, at a specific position in the genome. Whereas uh, the, uh, the purple examples below are actually uh, examples of individual reads uh, generated. So here I remind you, this is only about 10 reads. So this makes only a, a very uh, small subfraction of the actual reads that were generated in these, uh, in, these, in these experiments. And then when looking at uh, comparing at the ELF clamp data to the NCATS data, two obvious differences are there. Uh, so our ELF clamp uh, uh, assay has a much higher coverage. We have about a 20 fold higher coverage as compared to, uh, to NCATS. So we find that we have up to 1800 reads covering our, uh, our, our deletion when we, when we design our guide RNA a few hundred base pairs away from the deletion. Whereas uh, the NCATS assay very typically only gets about uh, around 100 reads covering a specific site in the, in the genome. But that said, another difference is obviously the, uh, clear, and that is that uh, our ELF clamp assay has much shorter reads. So our reads are more in the, in the uh, order of about uh, 2 KB, whereas uh, the NCATS reads are much, much longer. Uh, so I think both, uh, both essays uh, have their, uh, their advantages when, uh, when uh, determining how to, uh, how to characterize specific sites in the genome. So to, 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 to sum those up, so we think that ELF clamp uh, is, 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 has a, generates a very high coverage uh, uh, of, uh, of reads in the uh, or selected sites in the genome. So we find that about 20% of our reads are on target, which is considerably higher than the NCATS assay we're using the standard setup. This is more in the order of one to 2%. Uh, moreover, uh, our uh, assay allows for the amplification of fragments, which means that it's, uh, it's, 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 I think this is an important reason why we have a higher coverage of on-target reads. Uh, and I think uh, one other advantage is that we can do this with only the knowledge of one side of the read. So we design a guide RNA on only one side. And this can be, for instance, very useful when uh, uh, characterizing very complex translocations where we do not know very well what is going on on the other side of the of the of the of the of the read. Uh, that said, uh, uh, one one disadvantage of ELF clamp is very obviously that we have relatively short reads, uh, and we find that those rarely exceed two kb. So uh, um, even though we we expand, we go considerably further than what has been generated with Illumina sequencing, we're still relatively limited, and we're still working on trying to improve this length. Uh, but uh, yeah, at the moment we're we're we're, we're somewhat blocked at this. Um, on the other hand, NCATS has the, uh, the clear advantage that it uh, generates much longer reads. So many reads are over 15 KB in length, and we've been using this approach ourselves as well. We've uh, generated reads that are even over 50 KB, even though those, those, those are relatively rare, but they do appear. Um, secondly, uh, uh, I think NCATS has the great advantage that it works with native reads. Uh, so this also allows you to, uh, to go for co-detection of DNA methylation status at the, at the same time. That says, uh, 
NCATS has a disadvantage that there's a relatively low coverage. Uh, so you only have about 1%, uh, 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 relatively low coverage, you only have about 1% of reads are on, on, on target uh, when using the standard setup, whereas a somewhat more advanced uh, setup which reduces the number of uh, viewpoints that can be used, still only goes to about three to four percent of coverage. So it still uh, re uh, has a, a lower efficiency as our elf clamp assay. Uh, and finally, in a normal setup, where one needs to know the sequence on both sides of the read. So I think this limits a little bit the use uh, when uh, the, the, the the translocation partners uh, in complex translocations are not uh, are not uh, known. Okay, in the last few minutes, I then want to take a, a little bit of time to uh, to, to uh, talk about how we have been using ELFCLAMP uh, related to the, the topic of my lab, which is to study 3D genome organization with single cell precision. Uh, and so uh, my lab traditionally studies 3D genome organization using an essay that's called chromosome uh, confirmation capture, which is a sequencing essay to characterize 3D chromosome context. And the way we do this is by uh, taking uh, uh, the, the uh, cells but the, the, the genome is organized in a specific way. And what we then do is we add a chemical which makes sure that, uh, uh, that fragments that are in contact with each other, they become physically linked. Uh, for instance, then uh, creating large loops that are then fixed. And then by removing the intervening DNA, we end up with only those fragments that were initially in uh, spatial proximity. And then using enzymatic ligation, we physically fix those two fragments together. And then we use high throughput sequencing to, uh, to determine the nature of those uh, fragments on both sides of the, oh wait, someone is touching my slides. Um, then uh, without, uh, we, we, we sequence on the both sides of the ligation junctions uh, to then uh, uh, put them back on the, on the genome. And this, um, this then tells us which part of the genome we're interacting with each other. Uh, and then by uh, uh, generating uh, millions to billions of these read pairs, we can then uh, create these 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 uh, these these three C matrices located here on the on the right, where we can really get uh, these maps of genome wide three D genome organization. Um, but an important limitation of chromosome confirmation capture is that these ligation junctions are determined in isolation. So we do not know how each ligation junction relates to other ligation junctions uh, if they came from the same cell or from different cells. So these high C, these 3C maps that you see on the right, they are population averages from large populations of cells. And so this is a few more minutes. Yes, yes, I, I have a few more slides only. Uh, so this, we, we then decided to combine a nano C, uh, uh, sorry, our elf clamp assay with 3C uh, developing a nano C technology, uh, which allows us to sequence, uh, which is a sequencing assay to characterize a 3D geochromosome context with a single cell precision. And this provides information about cell to cell variation. And we can use this because in fact, what uh, what is, uh, uh, what happens during the, the, the chemical fixation of these contexts, we do not have uh, two contexts that are fixed together, but actually multiple contexts. And then we see that uh, the ligation products actually contains multiple fragments together. And then uh, by designing a, a viewpoint uh, in the elf clamp assay on a site that we're interested in, we can then, uh, without knowledge about any of the downstream fragments, uh, uh, amplify those fragments and sequence them uh, using the direct RNA approach on the on the uh, nanopore uh, sequencer, and then uh, by then mapping back those reads, uh, we can get uh, these. Uh, we can analyze uh, typically thousands of multi-contact hubs of uh, of three D interactions, and so we uh, these, uh, we show those multi-contacts as I show you here on the right, where we have our uh, fragment of interest where the guide RNA was designed, which we call a viewpoint, and then we show all the other interactions uh, on uh, on the same line. And so just uh, very, very briefly to introduce you the project that we are working on. And so this project has actually been the work of two postdocs in my lab, Li Xing and Surav. We are interested in using this nano C uh, assay and elf clamp assay to better understand uh, the presence of certain uh, DNA borders in the genome. And these DNA borders, they're very interesting because they're bound by a protein that's called CTCF. And this CTCF protein blocks contacts. Uh, and this has important functions for uh, uh, a gene regulation because these, bo these borders, they prevent contacts between, uh, uh, between promoters and other regulatory elements like, for instance, enhancers. But one thing that is important is that CTCF binding usually does not come alone in the genome, but these sites are clustered. And we think that this is due, uh, this is important because CTCF binding 
is not permanent, but is dynamic. And so this means that actually CTCF, uh, uh, as we detected in a, in a ChIP-seq assay, is actually uh, the binding, is, uh, the, the, the CTCF patterns in the ChIP-seq assay are population average of the reality of, of, of a dynamic process. And in individual cells, as I show you here, a uh, schematic, it's a little bit drastic in a way that I send it, so, uh, that I show it. But we actually think that there's variation from cell to cell. And as a consequence, we might actually have that the border uh, actually switches a little bit from, uh, from, from cell to cell. So uh, here in the last uh, slide, uh, I show you the, the, the results of such an, uh, such an experiment. Uh, and in this case, uh, we have our average DNA border indicated with a purple dashed line. And then in the black line just left to it, we have our, our fragment of interest. And we then ask, what is this fragment of interest uh, interacting with in single cells? And so here you see about uh, uh, data for about 600 cells in a region of about one and a half megabase in the genome. And then you see that all the blue uh, cells, uh, which make up the large majority, they have contact hubs that strictly obey the border. So in this case, we all have the reads that do not cross this border. And we also have a, a, a smaller fra a fraction of reads uh, in gray, where the contacts actually go in both uh, with on the left of the border and on the right of the border. And finally, we have a very curious population, which is the yellow population, where our viewpoint is located on the left of the population average border, but all our contacts are on the right of the population average border. And then uh, when we do statistics on this, what we find is that particularly the blue and the yellow categories are very strongly enriched over uh, what we would expect by just randomly positioning these interactions. So these mixed contexts are all, uh, are all uh, are very rare events, in fact. And we interpret this because our viewpoint is located so close to the TAD boundary, to, to the border. Uh, we interpret, uh, interpret this in such a way that we think that in the yellow situations, particularly, the border has shifted. So in this case, the border is actually left of the, of the uh, of the of the of the of the, the the viewpoint that we seek that we uh, targeted. So um, I can can talk about this much longer, but I'm out of time. So I just want to summarize what I uh, what I have to uh, what I, I tell, told you today. So I introduced you to into third generation single molecule sequencing and how it can generate multi KB reads. Uh, I also told you to get good coverage in the genome or on specific sites in the genome. We need to enrich and amplify these long DNA fragments. And I've shown you how we have developed uh, an elf clamp strategy to efficiently enrich and amplify multi-KB fragments. So we use amplification using linear in vitro transcription, uh, which has the advantage that we only need uh, knowledge about the sequence on one side of the DNA fragment. Uh, and then we can use the sequence generated RNA using Oxford nanopore direct RNA sequencing. And this uh, results in uh, I, I, uh, fragments that are uh, multi-KB, but relatively short still. So if you really are looking for very long reads, I advise you to rather go for this other option, the NCATS strategy. Um, I did show you that elf -Clam generates this very high coverage data for structural variation in cancer cells. And finally, I showed you how elf -Clam, uh, how we further develop this into nano-C to confirm cell-to-cell -cell variation of DNA border position. And that with then, I just want to thank the people involved. So particularly Li Xing and Surav, the two postdocs uh, involved in this project, and also all the other people in, uh, involved in the project and in my lab. I want to thank our collaborators and finally the funders. And I'll be happy to take, uh, I guess, a few more questions in the last few minutes.